We know that some people just don't like us. That was the matter of fact message that one of my rabbinic colleagues delivered to his congregants last month. In a sermon on Parshat Vayigash, as the Israelites leave Egypt in peace and Joseph is reconciled to his brothers, this rabbi acknowledged that no matter how hard we try, Israel and Jews are not very popular among a lot of folks around the world. Sometimes it's hard to focus on the good, he said. We know that anti-Semitism is out there. The rabbi who shared these words was Charlie Citron Walker, spiritual leader of Congregation Beth Israel in Colleyville, Texas. A week later, he learned up close just how deep that hatred is. Now we know the details by now, how he had allowed a man into the building, welcomed him on a Saturday morning out of abundant kindness because the man looked like he could use a cup of tea, how the man, Malik Faisal Akram, waited until the middle of the Sabbath service that morning with Jews quietly at prayer before he brandished his gun and held the rabbi and three congregants hostage for hours, demanding the release of a convicted terrorist who was being held in a nearby prison how the man became increasingly agitated and the rabbi finally threw a chair at him and got everyone out safely about how that allowed the police to come in and kill the gunman. We know that some people just don't like us. But we also know that anti-Semitism is more than just Jew hatred. It is a loathsome and paranoid centuries old conspiracy theory that is both pervasive and perverse. Pervasive as we see in story after story in the news of Jews being targeted. Here's what was reported to the Anti-Defamation League just in one week. January 13th, anti-Semitic graffiti was found on the walls in Fort Mill Middle School in South Carolina. Also January 13th, anti-Semitic flyers linking the Jewish people to the COVID pandemic were found in four elementary schools in Santa Monica, California. January 14th, a woman approached an eight-year-old boy standing outside a building in Marine Park in Brooklyn and shouted at him, Hitler should have killed you all, I'll kill you, I know where you live, before spitting on him. January 14th, individuals associated with White Lives Matter, Texas, held a flash demonstration in the city of Palestine holding signs and banners with anti-Semitic tropes, including Jews will not replace us. And the next day, the hostage taking at our sister congregation in Colleyville, all in one week that we know of. Anti-Semitism is pervasive and it's also perverse. And this was no more clear than in the hostage taking. Akram the gunman was demanding the release of Afia Siddiqui, a Pakistani woman who was imprisoned for alleged acts of terrorism in Afghanistan. And for that reason, the FBI originally announced that the Jews were not actually Akram's targets. They were very wrong and foolishly so. Akram deliberately took Jewish hostages because he really, really truly believes apparently that Jews are so powerful that they, we, could, could get Siddiqui released. Rabbi Citron Walker said later, this was somebody who literally thought that the Jews controlled the world. He thought he could come into a synagogue and we could get on the phone with the chief rabbi of America and he would get what he needed. This is what people believe. A lot of people all over the world that we Jews, rich, powerful, dedicated to no one but ourselves, secretly pull the strings of power, banking, government, even the weather. That we have space lasers to target and take out our enemies. That we are deliberately importing large numbers of black and brown people to this country to replace good God-fearing white Christian people who are on the only true Americans. It's nuts. It's an Irish kite, but Google it and see what pops up. Google it and see how dangerous it is. On the right, we are feared and hated as puppet masters of the non-white world. 
On the left, we are condemned and hated as colonialists who have stolen land from native people in the Middle East. Not just on the fringe either way, but increasingly and terrifyingly creeping toward the middle. Just before the hostage taking in Colleyville, the stated clerk of the Presbyterian Church USA accused the state of Israel of enslaving human beings and demanded accountability from American Jews. The statement was issued on the occasion of Martin Luther King Day. Martin Luther King, the man who himself once said, Israel's right to exist as a state is incontestable. Peace for Israel means security, and we must stand with all our might to protect its right to exist, its territory integrity. I see Israel, he said, as one of the great outposts of democracy in the world. But this kind of thinking more and more is bearing fruit among Americans who see conflict in the Middle East through the racial lens of our own country, a perspective that is both facile and ignorant, a belief that belies and denies the thousands of years of history that we Jews have had in our homeland, including 2000 years of yearning from afar. But there is a deeper perversity in anti-Semitism that I'm just now starting to realize after reading Dara Horn's disturbing and important book, People Love Dead Jews, Reports from a Haunted Present. Each essay in the book is a stop on a worldwide journey to visit places where Jews used to live and where Jews are now absent, where history has been rewritten and softened so that we do not feel the pain of dead Jews or face the brutality that destroyed them. Writing about the book in the New York Times last fall, Janov Ikovitz focused on what he called the blind spot in our collective memory. And that's both Jewish memory and the world's memory. How we recognize, he wrote as one example, the Chinese government's investment of $30 million to restore Jewish heritage sites in Harbin a city that was built by Russian Jewish entrepreneurs who flourished there until they were no longer required. And how, as Horn writes in the book, the world and today's Jews remain so fascinated by the dead Jewish girl, Anne Frank, and her belief in the goodness of people. It is far more gratifying, she wrote, to believe that an innocent dead girl has offered us grace than to recognize the obvious. Frank wrote about people being truly good at heart before meeting people who weren't. Three weeks after writing those words, she met people who weren't. The superficial sympathy that so many people hold for dead Jews contrasts horrifically with the way they despise and assault live ones. Take the case of Anne Frank herself, who remains such an obsession. This week, a new book purports to have solved the mystery of who ratted out the Frank family and sent them to their deaths. And the conclusion of this so-called cold case team led by a Dutch media producer is that a fellow Jew did the dirty deed. The story gained worldwide and uncritical attention before Holocaust scholars, history scholars with decades of experience threw a lot of cold water on the theory, which is based on scanty and circumstantial information. And as Dara Horn herself commented, the story neatly fits into an anti-Semitic trope of Jews turning against Jews. There's even a name for this in Jewish studies, she wrote, called Holocaust inversion. There's a reason why that's appealing to a non-Jewish audience. It makes you feel so you don't have to think about your own responsibility. And speaking of thinking about your own responsibility, the same United Nations General Assembly that just yesterday adopted a resolution sponsored by Israel to combat Holocaust denial. This is the same UN General Assembly that just last month adopted six more resolutions condemning Israel for various human rights violations. Since the creation of the United Nations Human Rights Council in 2005, it has passed almost as many resolutions condemning Israel than it has for the rest of the world's nations combined. Not Russia, not China, not Syria, 
not Saudi Arabia, not North Korea, only Israel. Only the only Jewish majority nation in the world. Jew hatred is Jew hatred, no matter how it manifests. American Jews are targeted every day with leaflets, taunts, beatings, and death because we are Jews. We used to think that we were safe in our sanctuary. After all, that's what a sanctuary is. It's the definition. It's a safe space. After the massacre at Tree of Life in 2018, we spent thousands of dollars hardening our building's security, and we'll be spending more to train ourselves how to respond, how to save lives, just in case. This week, Dr. Deborah Lipstadt, the world's preeminent historian of the Holocaust and the president's nominee to be our international envoy to combat and monitor anti-Semitism. Dr. Lipstadt penned an essay for the New York Times after the Colleyville attack on Jews at prayer. She wrote, another tragedy had been averted, but the scars remain. They will take a long time to heal. It is not radical to say that going to services, whether to converse with God or with the neighbors you only see once a week, should not be an act of courage. And yet this weekend, we were once again reminded that it can be precisely that. We are shaken, we are not okay, but we will bounce back. We are resilient because we cannot afford not to be. That resilience is part of Jewish DNA. Without it, we would have disappeared centuries ago. We refuse to go away. There is a blessing, she added, during early morning prayers that thanks God for allowing us to stand tall and straight. We are standing tall and we are standing straight, but we are checking for the exits. It seems to me that in many ways, Jews have always checked for the exits. We have recognized throughout our history that we are all too often never fully safe, never fully accepted, never fully at home. So, okay, it's okay to check for the exits if we have to. It's okay to do the emergency training if we have to. It's okay to watch the door if we have to. This may be the trade-off in Jewish America today, just as it has been for decades throughout communities in the rest of the Jewish world. This is our home. Our temple building is our sanctuary. Our temple membership is our family. And as Dr. Lipstadt said, we refuse to go away. Can you hear that song? Let this be God's will and our mission here on earth. As we say together, amen. <laughs>